All right, well, I'd like to officially welcome everyone to explore, capture, and study with your brain. Today's session is all about creating that visual context to really formulate and grow knowledge in your brain. So um, this seminar has a lot of different applications. Um, it could be, you might be designing your own corporate intranet, or you might be a university professor, teacher, student, um, everyone is trying to assimilate knowledge, learn and grow in your own way. So um, we're going to show you a lot of different examples of how it's not just a static knowledge archive where you put things away, but you can actively build and learn and grow in your brain and uh, you'll discover a whole lot of interesting things. Um, uh, my name is Shelley Hayduck and I'm co-hosting today with Matt Caton, our Director of Customer Solutions. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. As Shelley mentioned, this is one of our favorite webinars because we've got so many different examples to share with you. And we're gonna to focus today not only on just the structure of the Plex, your interconnected thoughts, we're also gonna focus on different styles and techniques and, and features of the brain to help you keep uh, diligent notes for the research, whatever the topic uh, may be within your brain and actually learn and evolve that content over time. Yes, yeah, so we've got some great examples, whether you want to do it visually with links or just dive into more traditional note styles, um, you know, any way you want to kind of get to that information or need it, um, you know, we, we can definitely do that with the brain. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started here with a couple of of uh, just a broad array of examples, just to kind of get everyone's uh, creative juices flowing going on, um, just the impact and potential of really collecting and amassing all your content in the brain. Um, so I've got my teaching and writing brain. You can create a brain that is about, you know, formal education, what you're learning about. Um, this particular brain is an example. We've got different interesting books. And one of the nice things about the brain is each thought can and um, have a connected piece. The voyage of a beetle, uh, of a beagle, very interesting uh, book that relates to biology and life sciences. So one of the nice things about a piece of information is it can be categorized in many different ways. When we are organizing things in folders or lists, um, you know, we're basically trying to separate content, but really in learning and memory and evolving uh, your own thought process, you're making connections all the time. So um, this is a book that was created, uh, written by Charles Darwin, and I have it as interesting books because it's one of the books that I'm sort of focusing on for my lesson plan. Um, but from there, I can go ahead and, you know, find new content on different theories of evolution and you know how that's grown and I also have a jump thought um, to a section in this brain on biology and life sciences and so um, this this cascade of knowledge can flow really nicely um, and so we're going to teach you how to sort of start that and build it and grow it and then navigate through that as well. Um, so I'm going to come back to this brain. Uh, before I go to this brain, I want to show you a few other uh, more content specific brains. Uh, I also have a writer's brain, um, which I particularly love. Um, and I use this brain to share um, different ideas with a, a group of writers. So one of the nice things about about the brain, and I'll just get to go, go back to the home thought so everyone can see um, this particular brain, is that you can actually have um, different levels of access, control, and permissions. So if I want to go, go to online and look at my brain access, um, your default will always be private. Uh, you can see that I actually have uh, myself and Harlan and Matt, the thought types. I'm also sharing this brain with Travis a few different things and I can add different people from my organization uh, in private mode I could also share this publicly in this case I have shared this brain publicly um, you know so that's another option so um, this uh, what you'll see is your brain can also be be extended and connected with other people's thinking as well very easily so in this particular brain um, I've decided to go very deep on a particular topic topic all about writing. Um, so one of the nice things about the brain is you can create a, a categorization structure that can really evolve and grow over time. And so in this particular example, I've got some uh, interesting uh, 
uh, ideas on elements of story. So one of the nice things about brain, a brain for an educator is you can actually take um, something that would normally just be a diagram. So in this case, the heroic journey is a very classic um, sort of formula um, that a lot of writers and script writers today use to evolve their stories. Um, and it sort of goes like this. There's a, a diagram where there's a call from the ordinary world and then the hero makes this this journey all the way back to uh, to home. Um, and a lot of writers will take these different elements and apply them to their own story. Uh, but one of the nice things about the brain is rather than that just being a static diagram, I can actually take each piece of that methodology. So in this case, it's the ordinary world, um, meeting with mentor, all the way to you know the, the big homecoming. Uh, these are just very classic type of um, elements of story and I can actually go through each piece and add my own information. So this particular uh, piece of information, I have links of characters that are mentors that I'm writing in a story that I'm working on and uh, I can continue to build the story. So each thought in your brain, of course, can have any number of documents or attachments. So in this case, I've got three documents and I can go ahead and click on any of those documents. Um, I can also do version control in the brain and take notes about what particular document I like to work on. Um, the other thing that's really nice is if you are studying, you can actually look at different videos and I'll give a chance, oh, I, I may, may not come through on the webinar, so I'll move to a different video, but you can actually have videos. Uh, we actually had a nice application and still do with uh, Dr. Craig ba Baker, the videos on the website were uh, up and coming cardiothoracic surgeons. We're actually looking at a lot of videos on how to perform surgeries, PDFs, online contacts. So really integrating this wide variety of sources and bringing it all together in a way um, that makes sense. Uh, can really help to formulate that single view, your view on that information. Another example um, that I'm gonna pull up is my science hero's brain. Um, in this particular example, um, I've created my own sort of curated view of just particular science topics that mean a lot to me. And one of the interesting things is you can kind of see, of course I could go to the web and uh, look at just Google different people um, but why is this better? Um, in this way, I've kind of created ideas for myself in terms of you know what matters to me, what I want to focus on. Um, so if I want to create a new focus area on, um, let's just go ahead and call this children's nutrition. And I can use the apostrophe field to say children's nutrition. I can go ahead and add that in my brain and then I've got a thought there and then I can start to evolve this and connect it to anything else that's relevant. So if I wanna go ahead and uh, do a search on this particular topic, I can use the brain search web feature and I love this feature and go out and sort of add information on, you know, children's nutrition. So there's a lot of interesting information, healthy diet, guidelines. So all I have to do is drag and drop that under my topic. And I'm now starting to build and grow my knowledge base. So I'm just gonna do a few more so you can see. And actually maybe what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll get some news items. So I'm gonna go over to news and uh, okay. Nutritional needs, children with disabilities. I'm gonna drag that and drop that in. And another link. So you can see I'm sort of growing um, this knowledge very quickly. Now I may not have time to read all these articles right away as I find them, um, but that's okay because I can continue to grow and develop this. And maybe uh, this particular uh, piece of information I want to link up to public health. So if I want to go ahead and move this down here, 
under public health, I can change and sort of rearrange things and kind of see, you know, what else is related to, to, to public health. We have a section here on vaccination, for instance, and one of the other interesting areas that I just added was on mRNA technology. So one of the nice things about the brain is as I'm building and growing, I'm going to discover things that I forgot. Um, I actually created a very cool section um, on Caitlin Carrico, who was one of the key inventors of mRNA technology, which of course is what all the COVID-19 vaccines are based on. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, and uh, I might want to actually put her under, I have a section on top 10. I might change this to just top female sciences scientists and make a connection. So if I'm kind of, maybe I'm trying to uh, uh, inspire my daughter, or I'm te teaching a lesson. I'm just going to change this. You can see how quickly, see how I'm kind of editing and gardening my brain as I will. So now I've got a, a list of some really cool female scientists. And the nice thing about the brain is, um, you know, you can use it to dump all your information in. So if you have some interesting ideas, um, you know, Matt's going to go a little bit more into notes, so I won't get too much into it, but I'm going to say um, this section can be really helpful for students in high school when they're trying to make career choices. So I'm just going to make that little note for my lesson plan. Um, and I can go ahead and capture that piece of information be like, but maybe I don't really know that much about these people. And that's OK, uh, because I can go ahead and uh, do a web search and build my brain and make these connections in real time. Um, for instance, I might want to add another thought on. I added this piece of content in from the website on Jane Goodall. So let's just go ahead and get Jane into our brain. And I've got that as uppercase. I can change that later. But for now, we'll just go ahead and get her in. And I'm going to go out to the web and do a search on Jane. And in this case, I might want to add her actual uh, web website to the content area in the brain. So all I have to do again is I'll, I'll give the webinar a second to catch up. So I'm just going to take this URL and uh, I'm going to drag and drop this on top of the thought. I can also drop it on the content window. And now what you can see is uh, any attachment that you have, and we can get into kind of different preferences, uh, but it's actually going to load um, the Jane Goodall Institute. Um, so that's pretty nice. And uh, so you, you have that information. Um, now, uh, this is relating to science. This is relating to the environment, all kinds of different things. Um, and I can continue to take a note on um, maybe I'm inspired by Jane to uh, think about our call to climate action, for instance. OK, so now I'm just making a thought about, you know, kind of what I want to do so I can take a note on this thought if I want to attach a document. Uh, I can go ahead and link to or add to or create any new um, file or folder from my brain. So if I want to add a file or create a file, or in this case, I might just want to take my own ideas down right here in real time. Um, this is pretty inspiring. And of course, I can check. I am thinking about doing you know xyz and that's kind of interesting and that could come uh, again maybe this call to action maybe you want to put this under your public health section for instance there we go or anywhere else and this this sort of grows um i can also copy thoughts um, from one brain to another. I actually have some really interesting um, stuff on the mRNA technology from uh, another brain from, I did a lot of research on drug companies and I actually copied this from our COVID-19 brain and added it in. So, so these brains can be, um, you can take thoughts and move them from one brain to another. And so let me just go ahead and go back to my writer's brain real quick. So you can see 
um, sort of the differences in structure. So in this brain, I've got more of a basic working uh, person's structure, what works for me, um, where it's about my writer's projects, what I'm kind of working on right now, um, what I'm inspired by. So that's a more personal uh, perspective on the information. Whereas the uh, writer, or the, I'm sorry, the um, science hero's brain uh, has a little bit more of a generalized taxonomy at the top, um, you know, about public health, um, different scientists, disease treatments. So um, you can kind of do a combination of things that make sense for your content and your audience, um, especially if you're sharing particular, um, the teaching and learning brain, for instance, does have a wide variety of different ways of looking at the information. And one of the other things that, um, what you'll wanna consider to do as you're adding your information is to create uh, both thought, link, and tags. So pieces of information in the brain can be organized visually by parent, child or jump thoughts so anything below my active thought is, is a subcategory so i'm just in my bio biology and life sciences section um, so in this particular uh, area i can go into the human body but what you'll notice is i've got a color coding on various thoughts and if i mouse over it you can see that that is a biological system and i've got an icon actually that represents that and everything blue is a disease and so these are thought types so you can actually create a nice typology for all your information and uh, if you want to go ahead and look at your thought types um, these are all the different thought types i have in this particular brain um, this brain is is sort of a, a, a all general liberal arts um, educational brain that's covering sort of a wide range of topics. So um, let's say I'm only interested in seeing things that have to do with neurotransmitters. I'm uh, going to go into neurology. I can click on that thought type and uh, immediately see uh, in my biology section everything that is thought typed as a neurotransmitter. So that's pretty interesting. Thing, um, you know, acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin all these interesting uh, neurotransmitters that we have, of course, in our body. And if I want to click on that, then I'm kind of moving into that area. And I can see um, that that particular neurotransmitter impacts a disease and the thought type diseases here. And this is Alzheimer's disease. And this is an area of research um, that I work on uh, personally. And, uh, you know, you might be teaching this class. So one of the other things that's nice about this is you can see how things really come together um, things that are very complex can be simplified visually, but but also um, not isolated. So rather than just having a folder with this research, um, I have it under lesson plan stuff that I might be talking about. Uh, hot topic section. I love putting a hot topic section in my brains. These are just just areas in my brain that like I'm really into or focusing on um, key interests. This can be, if you were just doing a project managed brain, this could be like active projects, um, similar to my writer's projects thought in my other brain. So there are so many different ways to, to organize this to really help you kind of leverage all the information that's in your head and out there, but also to evolve that information. Um, so let's go ahead and go back to this example. So I started off looking for particular neurotransmitters and I have those all organized as thought types. Um, we can show you how to create thought types. Um, it's actually really easy. I could just come in here and select a type, which this is already disease, but if I wanted to change this to, um, this doesn't necessarily make that much sense, but I'll call it a horizon of focus. Maybe I'm focusing on this particular issue. I can just select this and you can see it's actually, it's showing the thought type uh, up there, but it's also it also changed the color and the icon. So because this horizon of focus is a David Allen term for those of you that are familiar with GTD getting things done. And it's actually showing me that this is kind of one of my areas that I'm focusing on. So um, now if you want to classify a piece of information in many, many different ways, you can also, uh, in addition to linking it, you can tag it. Um, and you can see my, I have my thought tags on display tags are absolutely amazing and very important um, so for instance uh, maybe i am looking at uh, high cholesterol as it relates to alzheimer's this research topic i can come in here and uh, create a tag and maybe the tag for this is um, further research 
Um, and that's kind of cool because um, where I, when I'm busy in other areas, and let me let's say I'm back in just brain health. And this is this whole interesting section on brain health or just different diseases and human conditions that I'm researching. I can come back to this tag and go ahead and just click on, okay, well, I've got some time or I've got a new graduate student or help. Um, what is requiring for further research? What did I tag in you know, all my browsing on the web of what needs to be further research? And boom, here it is. Um, the tag is really nice for pieces of information that aren't necessarily logically connected, but they're more functionally connected, like I need to get this done, or this is pretty cool. So if you haven't played with tags in, in sort of studying and capturing your knowledge, I highly recommend tags. Um, they're wonderful, and then you can see everything kind of that I uh, want to tag. So um, just in terms of tags and thought types, another really cool example I want to show you before I pass presenter to Matt and we dive into um, the notes section, which um, is, is really great, is I want to go ahead and I'm going to show you my section here on United States presidents. All right, and it looks like so. One of the things that's nice about the brain is uh, you can actually, and I'm going to go ahead and adjust the thought, thought size here, as you can see. Let's change this in real time. Make it, um, sorry, it's a little hard to drive, drive my mouse with the go-to. I'm making this very small just so you can see the content, uh, see the sort of the, the, the large breadth of the content. Um, this is the other interesting question in terms of how you organize your information. Um, breath versus death. Some people just like a few thought categories or child thoughts below a topic. Um, some people like Jerry Mikalski and his ginormous brain, they, they have a whole bunch. In this particular example, um, we actually have thoughts, uh, the United States presidents all listed here. Uh, I have to add a few more, I guess. Um, and uh, you can organize thoughts and arrange them by type, which in this particular example, I've got them organized by Democrat. There's a party called the Federalist Party and Republican. So you can see the different colors that are actually, in this case, representing a political party. Um, so rather than wasting space, um, you know, having another connection to political affiliation, that kind of thing, this is another example of, of, of sort of coding knowledge with, with the various thought time. Let me just make that a little, a little bigger because I'm pretty sure someone in the Q&A is going to say that's too small. I can't see it. Okay, so hopefully that's better. Um, this is also another great example on zoomable icons. Um, the, the brain loves visual information. Um, so anything you can do to encode and make things more salient in your mind will really facilitate that understanding. That's why uh, the brain is such a great study tool because not only are you building your knowledge base, but by making these connections and sort of working on the knowledge, you're actually encoding the knowledge in your 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 wet brain as well. Um, so it's it's really quite an interesting process uh, for people, um, and uh, the knowledge does tend to be ret retained more. And of course, you can always come back to it and leverage it. Um, so what I wanted to show you here is this: you can also organize by name and change that. And so then they, they become chronologically organized. So number one, the first president we had was uh, was George Washington. And the last president we have, we, our current president is Joe Biden, President Biden. So um, you can change the uh, structure of the brain by simply typing and looking at things. Then of course I can also change my view. So if I want to see um, another level of content, I'm gonna I can put my distant thoughts on or I can actually go ahead and go to out. Now outline view is a pretty nice view uh, if you want to actually see more content. So if I want to go back up to the United States government, expand and collapse different areas of my brain, I can go ahead and do that. And I actually have a nice section uh, where I can go ahead and uh, show you in the animal kingdom, in my living things area. This is another example of thought types here where this is a formal classification of knowledge, but um, I've actually got the animal kingdom, in this case, phylum, in the, in the sort of peach color, where phylum chordata, and uh, you, know, you can continue to kind of open and expand these different areas 
and this is in biology and life sciences. I'm just going to go back to the normal view. So you can kind of see this particular, this classification as well. And of course, if I want to add distant thoughts, you can see what that looks like as well. So there's lots of ways to uh, see the information and connect it and add it into your brain. Uh, but I think with that, um, in terms of adding content, I'm going to, unless there's any questions, pass it over to you, Matt, um, so you can kind of show draggy dropping files and, of course, diving deeper into the notes section, um, which alone can be used, you know, kind of even as its own standalone tool, tool um, in addition to, to all the visualization capabilities. Absolutely. So I'm going to share my screen. And Shelly, I'm actually going to stay in the same brain that you were just demoing, uh, just as a nice, oh, nice. transition. And this brain, as Shelly mentioned, I think earlier in the, the webinar, is shared by multiple people. Um, so that's just one of the different license types you can have with the brain, whether you're just running the free license of the brain or get a pro license for more advanced features, but just a standalone desktop version all the way up to pro combo, you're syncing to the cloud and using your brain on multiple different devices. Shelly and I have team brain, so we collaborate in a few different da brain databases. It doesn't mean that Shelly has access to every single brain I ever create. We decide when we want to share different brains. And that's one of the topics that has come up in the questions, Shelly, that you mentioned. Um, you know, uh, when do you have one ver brain versus many brains? And that's one scenario. Shelly and I have team brain. So I've got my own private brain databases that I just keep on my local machine. We've got other brains that where I interact with other colleagues, friends, and different departments to share and collaborate in information. And so this is a brain that Shelly created and then shared with me. So I've added some of my own content. And this is where I'd now like to start talking a little bit about adding into the notes category of the brain. And it really starts with something that, that Shelly brought up earlier, which is um, why not just Google something? Um, yes, you can certainly Google and look for some information and find information on online, but do we really learn from Google? Google to me is a more advanced, um, I guess I'd call it a Dewey Decibel system. Um, it, it points us in the direction of where the information is that we're looking for, but we have to, have to actually go out there and find it and read the book and dig through that information. And Shelly, I'm just going to turn your camera off. I know you stepped away for a moment. Uh, so I am just going to hide Shelly's camera. There we go. And um, uh, so, yes, you could Google something for a quick answer uh, to a particular question. However, to go beyond that and actually learn, again, there's a bit more legwork. And so I'm going to dive back into the area Shelly was uh, sharing with us. So uh, things that I'm learning about, and I'm going to go into my sciences. And this is one of those brains, as we saw uh, Shelly was demoing, there's uh, information on mathematics, there's uh, social studies in here, economics and history and political science and so forth. I'm going to dive down into science and go into, and I love that Shelly touched upon this particular thought earlier, biology and life sciences. And already you're starting to see how the brain can pay off with, your, with its visual navigation. Biology and life sciences falls under a hot topic that I'm currently focused on. It also falls under sciences, which is a course that I'm taking right now in, in school. And it links up to related pieces of information, The Voyage of the Beagle, um, the book written by Charles Darwin, which evolved his theory of evolution and natural selection and so forth. So that's a related topic, but not necessarily a subcategory or a super category. And as you can see, you can drag this thought around the active thought to relink it at any time as well, if you need to restructure in your information. And going further into living things, uh, we were here with Shelly earlier into the animal kingdom, core data, animals with a backbone. Uh, so we've got reptiles, birds, here's mammals. And I'm gonna focus on marsupials. Um, so there are basically three different uh, families of marsupials. I think this one is uh, like possums here in the uh, uh, North America. There's a bunch of small different types of 
rodents and critters that are marsupials, and then there's practically everything in Australia. <laughs> so the reason why I'm choosing this particular topic to start talking about notes and content is, is also because of the cross-references that it involves. I am going to be focused on, there's many different kinds of, of marsupials, but one of them are omnivore uh, marsupials, so animals that eat meat, insects, berries, fruit, roots, leaves, and so forth, so they're omnivores. Tasmanian devil you might be for familiar with, or the bandicoot, uh, a couple of different Australian animals. One of them, however, is the Tasmanian tiger, an extinct animal. So I'm going to click and drag to create a new thought. And the Tasmanian tiger, the thylacine, I believe is typically what the scientific name. So the thylacine is extinct. Now, the question came up about, about rearranging thoughts. Maybe there's multiple different marsupials that are extinct that I'm gonna be researching earlier. I'm gonna create another jump thought called extinct. And from that extinct thought, I'll actually click and drag the parent thought off of thylacine up to extinct to connect those two. Oh, it didn't connect, so I'm going to start typing. There it is, thylacine. So I double click and link to that existing thought as I start typing in the thought name. I can see all existing thoughts that match what I've typed in so far. Connect those two thoughts and then unlink thylacine from I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. This is the, the, the what is this, the genus of the Australian marsupials, uh, Dasuromorphia. There we go. I, I gave it a shot. So all of the extinct uh, um, animals within uh, there, and I'm starting off with thylacine. So this is where my content and all my research will start. Let's start bringing in some data right now. I'm gonna make the brain a little bit smaller. And as you may or may not know, you can drag and drop data into the brain. So I've got some existing images that I wanna capture, some documents that I'm working on, uh, some PDF files and so forth. And of course, I can click and drag any of those directly into the brain. I've got my brain set up so that when I drag and drop, I move that data into the brain. Notice that picture is no longer there. And when I click on that picture, it actually loads it up right there um, in the brain's built-in browser. Now, I, am, I have several different pictures that, and more to come that I'm gonna be keeping track of. So I'm gonna rename this thought pictures. And rather than simply dragging and dropping to create a new thought, I am going to drag and drop to that existing thought. And I'm basically going to be giving myself a slideshow. Um, so I've got different pictures of thylacine. And when I go to that particular thought, it's going to load up the first one. And then I've got these arrows up above. So I can, oh, let's click on that once again. So I can scroll through uh, the different pictures that I have of that particular species. Uh, so that's where I'm keeping track of, um, of my pictures. And now I've got a document that I'm working on called, Is It Time? So in other words, is it time to bring this particular species back from extinction? That's a, a current focus that I have. And so I've got my Is It Time document. And of course, that launches in its native application, this being Word. So here is my document that I'm slowly working on in Word. And in the notes, is where I'll keep track of all of my uh, just meeting notes that I'm having with my team, class notes and so forth, things that I find on the web. Um, I've got a bunch of different web pages to bring in here. And sometimes I don't need the entire web page. So I'll share with you exactly what I mean. I'm gonna open up my web browser and I have some existing content all about the DX tech extinction of the thylacine. And the first one that's really uh, uh, important to me is a TED talk that happened a few years ago. And in this TED talk, as you can see, it's about 11 minutes long, but in the TED talk, um, this pre particular presenter referenced that the US government is investing in this technology. That was of particular interest to me. Why would the US government be interested in uh, bringing back the thylacine? And he went into the different impl implement implementations or impl ah, sorry, I'm, I'm word struck right there. Implement 
<laughs> I'm not even going to try it again. Uh, but the the results, what could potentially happen, both good and bad? Maybe they can figure out how to make a particular species go extinct, um, an evasive species or a dangerous species for a particular ecosystem. Um, but also the flip side of that, we get into Jurassic Park and we start uh, recreating dinosaurs and suddenly the humans are at the bottom of the food chain. So it's a very interesting topic. Um, and I'm going to be researching this later. So I'm going to drag and drop from my web browser right into the brain. So that's a really valuable resource uh, that I'm going to be watching again and again at a later date to pick up some little nuggets of there. And I've got a few other web pages as well. So I'll quick, quickly grab those. And this one is where the US military agency invests. So this one specifically is, is talking about that government investment. So I want to drag and drop that thought into the brain. And I'll grab one more. Speaking of investing, I found the thylacine.com website where I think it was, I found it here. Uh, what's the Chris Helmsworth, a uh, popular celebrity is investing in this technology. I don't know why I don't have time to research this article. This is sort of a fun uh, particular article that may be of interest to me. Again, I'll drag and drop and bring it right into the brain so I can go back to that article at a later date. Uh, but what's really important to me is the video and this uh, uh, potential that the US government is going to be investing in this technology and this particular thought. And here we start getting into the value of, of the structure of the brain that you're putting together and how that brings us further information. Uh, if you recall earlier, Shelley was in this US president's category that uh, falls under US government. Another thing that we're keeping track of or that I'm studying in my US government class is government spending. Um, you know, what goes into it, how it is regulated, maintained, the overviews of the treasury and so forth, quick view of how it works. And I'm keeping track of historical moments in the US government, uh, whether it's positive or negative, Clinton's balanced budget or the sort of uh, brouhaha that came up over a Super Bowl ad that the US government invested in, all the way to the case of the, some of you may remember the $435 Department of uh, Defense hammer that was purchased uh, under the Reagan administration. So a couple of historic events that are happening there. And now one of them, I think, is the US government investing a hundred million dollars in bringing back the Tasmanian tiger. Um, so that might, you know, gather more steam as this technology continues to grow. And there you can see I'm linking both biology research that I'm putting together in with my my government studies and tying a couple of uh, a couple of very interesting facts together. Let's start talking about the notes that I'm taking for this particular class. Um, I'm putting together this document. Is it time to bring back the Tasmanian tiger? So yes, of course, I can jump into the notes and the notes are truly my favorite feature of the brain application. And I can start uh, putting together just my thoughts and I'll even make this just a little bit bolder. So I've got my heading for my thoughts. And my thoughts can down, be down below. Um, whoops. Yes. Oh, I'll use my buttons up above. So I want to make this sort of a bulleted list of, you know, yes, because, et cetera, et cetera. No, because Jurassic Park. <laughs> And I'll spell Jurassic correctly. Thank you, Notes, for having a uh, spell check. Um, so, uh, of course, Notes can be that easy to do. Now, really quickly, I want to point out that I'm demoing today in the Brain 13. The Brain 13 is a beta that is available on our website. Our release version, uh, Shelly, today was demoing in the Brain 12. Uh, but the Brain 13, very stable. Um, I like the enhancements in the notes category. So if my notes, the toolbar up above looks a little bit different than the notes that you're using, it may just simply be, be because I'm uh, currently running the Brain 13. And you can find more about the Brain 13. It's a public beta on our website. But here's what I wanted to, uh, to share with you. 
Um, there are many different ways, as I mentioned earlier, to take notes in your brain. Obviously, you can start just typing in some information. When we find a little nugget of information that we like on a website, this is something that I use in particular. You know, I don't always need the entire web page. This website, if I were to print it out, would be 10 pages long. I'm just scrolling and scrolling. But here's a really, really interesting paragraph that I just happened to cue in on. And I'm simply going to uh, you know, copy that particular content onto my clipboard and I can jump back into my notes, note and paste. So when I find something of particular in interest or a fact, uh, uh, something that I need, and again, I can pop this out into my own browser if I ever like, if I don't want to be reading this in the Brains built-in browser, I can copy and paste from here as well. So there's some information about the CRISPR technology, copy that and I come back into my note and just simply control V, paste that right in. So I've captured that information out of a huge, huge page. What I really need is the information about CRISPR. I can create a new thought about CRISPR from here that I want to start researching. Maybe I'll even launch this CRISPR technology in the Brain's built-in browser and drag and drop that to create a new thought with a link directly to that web page that was being referenced from a paragraph in another article. So I'm starting to bring all these disparate information sources together. Rather than saving web pages in my browser bookmarks and favorites, my Word documents in another directory, pictures in a folder somewhere, all of the pieces of, of knowledge that I need to do my research are within just a few clicks of one another. Another tool that I wanna share with you and talking about variations of, of taking notes within the brain, here in this particular brain, we've got an area for best practices. Um, many people have many different apps for taking notes or processes for taking notes, whether it's getting things done. Um, I believe we mentioned that earlier in today's webinar, David Allen's sort of structure for managing our busy lives and how to keep information front and center and, and um, you know, in an order of importance, basically, the um, uh, many of his techniques are mapped out in this particular area of the brain. The one that I'm going to use today is the Cornell note-taking system. So a professor from Cornell University decided, you know, here's how good notes can be taken to, to, become, to be a good student. Here's what it boils down to. And I've got a video here that you can watch to learn all about the Cornell note-taking system, um, what it is, and then a separate video on how to use it and why it benefits you. There's my screenshot. Um, basically, three different areas on a piece of paper. Your cues, I sometimes think of those as topics or questions. Uh, but then your notes on that particular topic or cue or question, and then down below the summary. And if you can structure your notes in this particular format, you'll retain that information. It'll be easily accessible in the future and so forth. And so here on this particular thought, thought I also have a template that I can copy and paste so I can keep notes on U.S. government on my own, uh, my, my financial studies class, on bi my biology class and so forth. So I am actually going to copy this. So here I'm just in a note uh, on this particular thought in my brain, I copy that content and I'm gonna use the past thought list to go back to my thought on the thaline, is it time? And here's how I'm gonna start structuring this particular note. So current date and time, I like to hit control D on my keyboard or you can select to insert the current uh, date and time. So if I'm taking uh, class notes, I know when that particular topic was discussed or you know when those questions came up, when we uh, that particular note was taken. Down below my cue, um, so my different questions. Um, let's say is the is the Tasmanian tiger, Taz tiger, extinct? Some people believe that it is not. Um, um, different farmers, I've got articles, I'll save you the time, but different farmers and so forth, uh, say they've taken trail cam footage of, of the Tasmanian tiger. Scientists believe there's signs of Tasmanian tigers 
uh, living in very remote areas. So I can keep my notes on those about farmers and uh, that have claimed to see it, science, scientists, their facts and so forth. And when it's time to add a new question or a new cue, I can click the little plus on the other side. And this is just simply a table within the brain. Tables in the brain are fantastic. If I go up to insert, let's go down below. And I want to create a new table that is five, uh, five columns with 10 separate rows. I can insert a table that is five columns and I can go five by eight and then continue adding more. So to add two more, just put my cursor on the side plus and plus. There's a five by eight column. And I can click on this button up above uh, to open up the table uh, uh, toolbar up above and format my table. So what are the what the fonts going to look like? What are the colors going to look like? Uh, down below, I can choose color patterns that are going to work for me uh, to manipulate that particular table. So let's delete that. I don't need that. I just want to show you really quickly how to create a table in the Brain 13. Now I've got a new table of... Um, should it, uh, should it, in, a, in other words, should we bring the Tasmanian tiger back and can we do it? Do we have the science? Can we? And uh, again, my bullet points over on the right and down below my final summary. Now, I actually created this table ahead of time in another brain. So I'm going to go to that brain that I have here on another screen and just simply copy and paste it into uh, this particular thought. Let's see if I can paste this. So October 5th, 2022, my topic of de-extinction of the Tasmanian tiger, my notes down below, is it truly extinct? Can it be brought back? Uh, brought, there we go. And truly, let's spell everything correctly. And then my summary down below. So this is, in a nutshell, uh, the Cornell University notes uh, note-taking system being utilized in the brain notes. So just a couple of different examples of ways that you can uh, formulate your notes, learn from your notes, and preserve that knowledge over time in the future. Another feature that I want to share with you is I'm going to jump over into another brain of mine, and this is my Shakespeare brain. Now, this harkens back to a question that I saw coming in in the chat. And uh, really quickly, just a quick overview, one brain versus many. Should I put everything into one brain? If I'm studying Shakespeare in school, that should go into my other brain, right? It certainly can. I could have a branch for literature and Shakespeare and put that information there. In this case, um, I like to keep my Shakespeare brain separate from everything else. This is a real brain that I use not necessarily on a daily basis, but it contains the complete works of Shakespeare and all my notes and research that I do just recreationally uh, on the topic of the Bard and his literature. So under literature, I have all of his uh, comedies, his poetry, his history plays, his sonnets and his tragedy plays. Nothing new there. You can do web research and find the, you know, Romeo and Juliet, the complete uh, script, no problem. I organize mine, though, um, in a little bit of a different way. So there's by the actual category, whether it's a comedy or a tragedy and so forth. But under resources, I'm keeping track of sort of the Shakespearean timeline. Um, when he first started writing, the beginning, notice all three of those plays are comedies. He thought that's all anyone in my understanding, he thought that's all anyone wanted to see was something light and comedic until he started getting hired at the Globe, the Kingsman, whereas it's uh, Lord Chamberlain. The Lord Chamberlain wanted history plays to teach people about King Henry and Richard II and, and so forth. So he still created Midsummer Night's Dream during that time, but then he starts getting into things that were a little bit more serious. So it just adds greater context. And I go all the way into... Uh, well, not the death, but the retirement of Shakespeare, sort of his last plays, and The Tempest. The Tempest is a really, really interesting uh, play. And if you read it, you might just think, oh, it's about a sailor that goes off and gets lost and decides to continue on on his, on his lost journey sailing the world. 
and voyaging out into the nothingness. But when you realize it's Shakespeare's last play, it is Shakespeare's farewell. There's a huge farewell speech that the sailor gives at the end of uh, um, at the end of the play, Prospero. And he's not just saying farewell to his shipmates, he's saying farewell to the stage and maybe even farewell to life. He died soon after. So maybe he knew that that uh, he was um, in his in his golden years and and would soon be gone forever. And having that understanding to me just provides so much more meaning when I read through the play. Um, and so it's got my own personal notes and, and research that I've done that is is very exciting. However, I also do, uh, as you can see, some character studies on plays that I read or maybe even plays that I've been in. Uh, I'm going to go to here, A Midsummer Night's Dream. I've got the opera, uh, but also technical studies of the stage, famous art, and characters within the play. So first, let's look at the plex. We have Oberon, and Oberon loves Titania, and they have a little fun with the uh, fairies in the forest and have Puck cast a few spells giving Bottom um, one of the uh, technical characters that puts on the play within a play, a donkey head, and has uh, actually Titania fall in love. As you can see, Puck casts a spell on Titania, so she temporarily falls in love with Bottom, who has a donkey's head. So the links within the Plex are giving us greater information about the, inf the knowledge that we're storing. I don't just have a thought called Puck and a picture of what the character might look like. I've got a little bit of an overview of what's happening. The four lost lovers in the play, Lysander loves Helena, Helena loves Demetrius, Demetrius loves Hermia, and Hermia loves Lysander. So that's the sort of lover's triangle, be a quadrangle um, uh, within the play as well, which is all mapped out. So the links can give us more information. You can simply double click on a link between two thoughts and add additional context and even make that link directional. So I know if Puck gives the donkey head to Bottom or Bottom gives the donkey head to Puck. And of course the arrow should go that way. And now let's talk about one more feature in the notes and that is quite simply the table of contents. Table of contents can be inserted into a very long note. You're a student, you're a teacher, you've got a document that's your syllabus, um, or it's just an outline of a book you're reading, a project you're working on. If you're utilizing some of the formatting styles within the brain, such as titles and subtitles and so forth, and this is a great example because I've got a nice long note that's all about Puck through the years, uh, famous quotes and so forth, I can actually insert a table of contents. So insert table of contents. Control Alt T or Control T, keyboard shortcut, would just be a pop-up table of contents. So if I didn't want it there permanently, but I wanted to see, ooh, on this thought, Control T, let's see where my information about uh, portrayals of Puck in music. So I can go directly to uh, where Puck shows up in music and different Claude Debussy's opera, which is um, also talked about in my uh, opera area of this particular play. So let's leave a permanent table of contents here at the top. I'm just going to place my cursor, insert a table of contents, and there, as you can see, are in this long note, I don't need to go scrolling through where did I have information about uh, um, uh, you know, different particular characters that played uh, Puck in film and TV. I think Stanley Tucci uh, played Puck in, in a very famous movie. So he's probably of particular note in film and TV. I can go and there he is, Stanley Tucci playing Puck in the 1999 film. Um, so a table of contents can be particularly useful and that will evolve over time. If I have a new category of Puck in rock and roll music. I'll just start here. Well, the name of the character here, portrayals. I'll create a new character or a new category, rock and roll music. I don't know of Puck being in any rock and roll music, but I can simply add this into my list. So that is going to be a heading. And when I go back to my table of contents, there it is. I've created that 
that uh, heading and I can easily get to that content. And then one more thing about long notes is also if you're utilizing these headings and titles and so forth, if I don't really need the summary or the appearances within the play, I'm focused on uh, something down below, the name of the character, where the name originated. I can actually minimize this content as well. It's still there. I can simply minimize that content so I'm focused in my note. Maybe I'm giving a presentation and I don't want to be looking at a character summary or appearances within the play. I can simply minimize those so I'm focused on the name of the character. I can minimize all of his portrayals and that is what I'm focused on here in the note. When I'm ready, I can expand and bring back all of that additional content. So many, many different ways that you can take very, very helpful notes within your brain. Each individual thought has its own note uh, that is available, as you've seen, that you can cut and paste, uh, copy images, paste images. And this is the final component of notes that I'll share with you. I'm actually going to minimize uh, the Plex. And as you can see, this note is so long, I still have to scroll through it. So I'm going to go into my brain properties. So if I go into options and preferences, rather, on my notes editor, I am going to switch to a multi-column note. So now, as you can see, I've got plenty of room for having, uh, as you can see, let's look at Puck as a little baby. As I scroll down, it appears on this page. So it starts on the other page and appears on the next as you continue to scroll through. So multi-page notes. I'm broadcasting at a very low resolution today um, just so that everything keeps up in time and hopefully you're seeing everything as I'm clicking on that content. I've got another monitor here off to the side, very high resolution, a large monitor, and I go into my multiple notes display and on very, very detailed long notes, I can see four or five pages at a time and it just becomes very, very helpful uh, to, uh, to have easy access to all of that note. And I can even select, drag and select from one page all the way over to the other to copy that content uh, if I'm, you know, utilizing segments of, of data to put together into a document that I'm working on. So I think that's everything that Shelly and I wanted to share with you today. Um, the different ways to, again, contain all of your data, regardless of its file type, web pages, Word documents, spreadsheets, your own personal notes, all in one easily accessible database that can then be synced to the Brain Cloud and accessed from multiple devices. Some more advanced features of the, not really advanced, but just an advanced license type, the Brain Pro Combo allows you to access your brain from multiple devices, all the way up to, as you've seen here, Team Brain, where Shelly and I are collaborating in the same brain database. And with that, I see uh, Chase has been keeping very busy in the GoToMeeting question panel, and we're right at the end of the hour. So Chase, go ahead and uh, turn on your mic. And if you'd like to present me with any questions that came up during the demo today, I'd be happy to uh, to give you exa specific examples of those features. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got a first one up here. Uh, can you provide an example of how you can create links to other thoughts and other brains? Oh, absolutely. Um, a great example of that that I just stumbled upon in this particular brain today. I think I was on Falstaff, not today, but recently. Um, I read Shakespeare recreationally, uh, Falstaff, um, and down below, these are uh, Falstaff under this thought or under any thought you may have noticed in the brain. Um, um, we'll have references to number one, continuing to navigate, even without the Plex. If I minimize my Plex, I can see that Falstaff falls under. He's a character that was used many times by Shakespeare, the Merry Wives of Windsor, Henry V and Henry IV, both part one and two. So I can go to that particular play, Henry IV, part one, and continue navigating through my brain without ever uh, displaying the Plex. And if I get all the way to the end of this play, I can see Henry uh, falls under Lord Chamberlain history, and I can continue navigating uh, through my brain this way as well. Um, so that's a great little feature. And I happened to notice while I was on the Falstaff thought, and again, down in my backlinks and map links and references, that Falstaff is being mentioned 
on a thought called The Witch. Now, The Witch is a play that was written by Thomas Middleton. So if I click on The Witch, um, I've got a copy of that text here that I can read through, but I just made a note as I was reading it, several of the lines of The Witch seem to be similar, almost exact quotes of what Falstaff says to other characters in his plays. Um, so I just made a note, who copied who? Are they stealing ideas from, from one another? And I did a little bit of research. Uh, did Shakespeare and Middleton write together? And as it turns out, they both were writing for the Lord Chamberlain at the same time. They probably saw each other's plays or bounced ideas off of one another. I found out that that was just fantastic. But also, while reading The Witch, uh, so I'm going to go to uh, The Witch, or while reading The Witch, um, I noticed that he referenced this word called, called whites without the H. Notice at the bottom. So uh, Unlinked mentions Troila, Troilus and Cressida says, Beshrew the witch, so there's the unlinked mention, with venomous whites she stays. What is a venomous white? So elsewhere in this brain, I have my own dictionary. Now, this is something that I put together manually. Anytime I come to a word and I don't know exactly what that word is, or like wall-eyed, what is wall-eyed? I know there's a fish uh, called a wall-eye, but it actually, I looked it up, it means fierce-eyed. It just means you're looking mean, you're angry. So in King John, that ever wall-eyed wrath or uh, staring rage. Uh, so it's a furrowed brow, basically. Um, so I keep track of words that I don't understand. I type them into my alphabet. I have the entire alphabet of, that I've put together of words I didn't know. And one of them was white. So let's get back to whites. What is whites? So I looked it up. It's an old English or mythical character, a sentient being, often undead, slow, comes clumsy, and cold. And in my research, I found that White Walkers in the Game of Thrones, maybe, although it's spelled on all the different web pages, W-H-I-T-E, W-I-G-H-T, a White Walker is, is how it uh, was written maybe in the book. I can't remember exactly. So very interesting. Uh, modern movie, Game of Thrones, and they chose White Walkers from, from texts that Shakespeare wrote years and years ago. I happen to have, if I go into my brains list, there it is, a Game of Thrones brain. And if I go down, into, it'll take me a while to maybe find it. I think it's the Battle of Winterfell. There it is. The Oh, sorry. There's going to be some spoilers in here. Look away if you've never seen, <laughs> seen Game of Thrones. But there it is, the Battle of Winterfell. And this guy, the Night King, is a White Walker. Let's link those two thoughts. So the, since this is White Walker was referenced originally by Shakespeare, I'm going to go to my Shakespeare thought. I'm sorry, this took a long setup for that one question, Chase, but I just wanted to share with you how two very different brains could have content that's related. Um, and I'm going to right click on this thought and select copy local thought URL. When you create a brain, each individual thought has its own local thought URL. So you can copy and paste that into a Word document we're working on. If you're sharing a brain here at the Brain Technologies, we will often um, uh, just instant message someone, hey, go to this particular thought in this brain that you have access to. Um, and this is another example of how to use this feature as well. I can copy the local thought onto my clipboard. There was also copy web thought URL on there. So if you've synced your brain to the cloud, there's an online. Uh, link to that thought. I'm copying, copying the local thought URL and under Game of Thrones brain, I'm going to right click and I'm going to paste that link. So from one brain that's all about the TV show Game of Thrones, I can click this attachment for this thought. It's going to take me directly to my definition in my uh, dictionary of my Shakespeare brain under resources for my Shakespeare brain to a completely different brain. So that's how you can link one brain to another. It's the local thought URL that you're looking for, and you can link different types of brains. Uh, if they reference the same information, you can link those two brains together very, very quickly and easily. Fantastic. And next one up here, uh, when is it best to add information to an existing brain rather than creating a new one? You know, that is a 
very personal choice. Now, true, I could go into the teaching and learning brain, and if I have a literature area, let's just get to the home thought. So things I'm learning about, I've got my completed courses, language arts. Let's say I sign up for a Shakespeare class, I create a new thought, Shakespeare, and start creating that data here. Um, I have chosen to create my Shakespeare brain and keep it separate for a number of reasons. Number one, I share it with other users. Um, I don't give anyone else editor access. I'm the only one editing that particular brain, but there are other people out there that have interests in, in Shakespeare as well. So I sync that brain to the cloud and you can actually go online. And, and at the end of today's demo, you'll all receive a link to rewatch a recording of today's demo access to download the different brains that we've demoed today. So you can actually extract them and keep a copy of that brain. You can have a co your own copy of the Shakespeare brain, continue on editing whatever content you'd like, or just simply go out to my brain online and view it through the web browser and click through, uh, through the brain structure. Um, if I were to put it here and start developing all my Shakespeare data and give you access, you would also have access to all the information that we have on United States presidents and biology and mathematics and so forth. So this brain is a much broader example brain of a student studying many different courses, um, whereas the Shakespeare is much more uh, laser focused on just the topic of the works of Shakespeare. It's a personal choice. You can always come back and merge two brains together or segment them apart if uh, that's of interest to you. That is a little bit more of an advanced feature, but it can certainly be done. And actually, if I had a crystal ball, I just I have a feeling you're going to ask me to demo that next, but I'll 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 see. <laughs> yeah, next question was actually, uh, can you demonstrate how to merge two different brains together into <laughs> one? <laughs> yes, absolutely. So let's say that uh, in this massive brain, we just wanted to study um, the U.S. presidents, the history of the U.S. presidents. Um, I'm going to, as Shelly showed us earlier, I'm going to rearrange my thoughts by name. So I've got them in order from George Washington to Joe Biden. And I am going to control click. Now I'm going through this really, really quickly because it is a more advanced feature. And we do have tutorials specifically about this process and all the sort of uh, sub features that go into uh, these capabilities. But really quickly, I'm going to control click on US presidents. So I've added it into my selection box. I can control click on individual thoughts that I may be interested in, add those in to the selection box, or I can even control click and drag to add a whole grouping of thoughts. I can control click on a gate and add the entire, all the children. And if I can control click again, it removes the children. It's like a toggle switch. Add it, control click again, remove it. So uh, control click up here, industrial revolution, remove that from the selection box. So we're adding thoughts to the selection box with the control key. That's the command key on a Mac. I'm gonna select uh, to edit, select related thoughts. So every child word thought, so below the US presidents for we'll just say up to two generations away. I don't wanna to add too much content. So that's 50 thoughts that I've added into the selection box. Most of these thoughts don't have content down below. Uh, I'm gonna right click, copy those. And now let's start a new brain file. And we say create brain. Um, I'm just going to call it the U.S. brain. So we've created a new brain called the U.S. brain, and I right-click in the background and I paste those thoughts. I've taken a segment, a section of my teaching and learning brain and pasted that content into, um, into a new brain. So that's how you can take a portion of a brain, segment it out. If I wanted to, I could go back to teaching and learning. I can right click and forget all of these thoughts. I don't want to do that. Um, so if, in other words, if in the future, I'm going to only reference all the US presidents from this new standalone separate brain, I can copy and paste them first then come back and delete them. So that's how we can segment a brain. Now, if we wanted to merge this brain, this new brain into yet again, another brain, maybe it's world politics we're studying now. 
and I want to merge in my U.S. president's brain. I'm going to click on, I'm going to go back to the home thought, U.S., and say file. I'm going to export, actually, no, sorry, file, and I'm going to back up to a brain archive. So I make a BRZ copy of this particular brain. Two options, you can keep it protected. So in other words, you with your brain account, you're the only one that can extract that data, or you can make it a brain that anyone could extract if they get a hold of the BRZ file. So a little security feature there. And I'll back that up. That's gonna sit on my desktop. Now I've got that file. It's on another, showing up on another monitor on my desktop, but I can navigate to another brain. Uh, let's go into Game of Thrones and under rights, I'm gonna say file import and I'm going to import a BRZ file. So I can either create import that as a new brain or add it to an existing brain. I'm adding it into an existing brain here. Select file and I go to my desktop and there it is, the US president's brain that I just created. And I can select this. I do not need to import the list of all US presidents into the Game of Thrones brain, but that's the process that you would follow, importing a BRZ. Uh, to merge two brains together. Uh, to segment a brain, you control click or command click on a Mac, a section of thoughts, copy them and paste them into a newly created brain database. Perfect. And I think maybe um, we've got time for one or two more questions, Max. Yeah, I have okay. one more good one here for you. One more, great. Um, is there a way to filter thoughts by types and tags at the same time? You certainly can do that with the, um, um, with the reports. So in this particular thought, I want to show a report. Now, I don't know this brain. We got sort of got sidetracked into a very strange brain here. Let's go to the home thought. But I do know that we've got thought types and tags. So uh, if I just do a refresh, I've got an alphabetic listing of all the thoughts in this brain. There are eight, uh, 389 thoughts in this brain. But if I say, all right, show me all thought types uh, that are um, have a house name. So it's going to show me only thoughts that it narrows it down to 88. So only uh, thoughts that fall under some particular house name and of the link type. So so again, there's a thought type and a thought tag. A thought type is a single category that you can have. Um, a thought tag is, you know, you can have multiple different attributes. So I can scroll down through this list. These are all my thought types, and these are down below our link types. I guess maybe they're, oh, here are the tags. They're on another tab. So I'm showing just the 88 thoughts that fall under a house name. And tags, I'm just going to find which ones are deceased. Um, so there are deceased. So it goes down to 64. That's kind of a lot. If you follow Game of Thrones, you know that pretty much every character along the way is going to die a, a tragic death at some point. So that's just part of the movie. But nonetheless, I've gone from three or 400 thoughts to just the 88 thoughts of people that fall into a particular house. Uh, it's a, you know, a, a family or gang or whatever you want to call it that the, those characters belong to and which one of them are now deceased. Or if I want to say which ones are deceased and a king. So they're a king that has been deceased from a particular house uh, party. There are seven of those thoughts. So I'm really filtering things down and I can then go directly to that particular character. Sorry if you didn't know that happened yet to uh, Renly in the house of uh, Baratheon at the Storm's Baratheon. End. Baratheon, thank you. <laughs> There's a new series, so if you haven't seen this, you're, it's fine. It's okay, an old, good. old yeah. series. And you series. know what? Yeah, maybe they all come back. I don't know. <laughs> but regardless, yeah, sort of a, a, a strange process took us all the way from these uh, wonderful teaching and learning brains into another brain. And it's a great example of why you keep separate brain databases. And that. family tree. There's the Tudor yeah. brain, the Tudor dynasty. If any of yeah. you are into family trees is also quite, quite interesting. Um, but it's also, yeah, a good example of you can be studying anything, whether yes. it's an actual class, uh, research for um, you know, some uh, type of a new drug or medication to just interest in a hobby 
uh, mm -hmm. literature, TV, uh, whatever the case, your own family tree, mapping those out and keeping those diligent notes and, and additional content on each particular topic along the way. And so Shelly, we just went through uh, about uh, 10 or 15 questions. Uh, yeah. Other, yeah, questions that came up or follow up? No, I think we've we've got them all. Um, uh, a lot of people are asking about the, the event being recorded and yes, mm -hmm. Um, we will have a recording that is automatically sent to you. Um, we have the, all these brains that we presented. Uh, we have templates, so we will make the templates uh, available. I don't know that anyone needs Game of Thrones, but the other templates, especially Matt's wonderful Shakespeare brain and uh, maybe even the template for the Cornell note, um, which got a lot of, uh, generated a lot of excitement uh, with attendees. So um, I think that's it. Um, for those of you that are new to the brain technologies, um, we've covered a lot of ground deliberately because um, we have uh, kind of the seasoned and, and new users on this call. But if you want to take a step back and just get into ground up brain creating, uh, do join us. Uh, every, you know, every Friday we have the Brain 101. Matt hosts that class. It's a smaller class, too, so we can actually demo like every question for the webinars. Chase is in there typing away and I'm typing away. And most we answered most of your questions. But if we've missed any question, um, we do apologize. Oh, Bill is asking, um, any webinars on the Brain 13? And I'm sorry if I missed it, if we covered this in earlier questions, but I guess um, the Brain 13, um, we actually probably will have a webinar um, in, in this coming, now that we're in October, hard to believe we're in October. Um, so uh, do sign up to for our newsletters or follow us on Twitter. And I just wanna reiterate, I was on 12, Matt was on 13. Anyone who buys today um, automatically gets the upgrade. So there's no need to wait um, if you're waiting for 13 to be released. And of course, um, if you're a cloud member on our subscription plan, those upgrades just will happen at any time. Uh, the beta is pretty stable and pretty amazing. I'll let Matt speak to that. So feel free to download it and try it. But on the other hand, 12 is also great. And I'm on 12, Matt's on 13. Nice to meet you. Uh, it's all good. So Matt, I don't know if you have anything to, to add. Obviously 13 will be, is, is even better and will be better when it's the final release. But if you're somebody who doesn't necessarily want to use beta software, that's, that's also perfectly fine as well. That's right. And it's all available from the banner at the top of our homepage, the mm -hmm. Brain 13, clearly labeled as a, as a beta. I'm using it today just to demo that it's perfectly stable. And, uh, you know, Shelly and I are even using the same brain database that we've shared through the cloud. She opens it in 12, I open it in 13, no problem. 13 yeah, that's right. So you might have somebody who's a little bit more straight straight and narrow that wants to stay on the official release in your office and you know, somebody who's a more, you know, you know, uh, likes to try a new technology. So the the two versions obviously um, sync and they're compatible. Um, so so that's all good. So definitely give it a try. Um, Matt also covers you know what what you can do in 13 so if you do download the software and we have a great tutorial we're, we're putting more of those out and um yeah we're gonna there's there's more to come on 13 so uh thank you for that question yeah and, uh, let me just see if there's anything and really just while you're looking you know the reason why i wanted to demo in 13 today is just because of the fab fantastic new tables that we took a look at um are there and uh, and accessible to you and somebody's asking about mind mapping. Um, we do have imports for mind maps as well. So um, obviously we've got our own mind mapping view that we did not cover. I showed expanded view. Um, if you go up to the, the menu, you can. we have a mind mapping view, but if you wanna import any uh, mind maps, uh, you can also do that as well. And that's Kim's question. Can a mind mapping software achieve the same as a brain? Yes. And one of the nice things about the brain is because it goes a little further than just mind mapping, um, where mind mapping can, can get a bit cumbersome because it's just single file based with a lot of items. With the brain, you have unlimited scalability. 
Um, so we're very happy to play with other mind mapping software. I actually know somebody who drops in their mind maps into the brain and still stores them in the brain as the database. I, other people import them, other people switch. So there's just depending on your content and your preference, there's there's many ways to do it. Um, but we are uh, we cross a lot of different categories, note taking, knowledge based, mind mapping. Uh, so if you were to ask me if we are a mind mapping software, I would say yes. And uh, Matt's showing you our, our mind mapping new, uh, view, Kim. I don't know if you have anything else to, to say about mind mapping or? No, it's definitely, uh, and this is a feature of the Brain Pro licensing. So um, if you want to view, it's really great sometimes just to get an overview, sort of high level overview of a project that you're working on or a collaborative uh, process that you're, that you're working through. Um, just to have that nice high level overview. Typically in our demos, we stay in what we call normal view, which is the current active thought and one generation away from the active thought. And it's just nice to have that flexibility within the brain so you can really focus on the current topic at hand, or you can expand and uh, sort of brainstorm about a project that you happen to be working on, whichever right. is working best for you. And when you're in mind map or outline view, you can continue adding new thoughts and relinking thoughts together to one another as just as you can in the normal view as well. The outline view and mind mapping view is, is nice. Uh, earlier in the demo when I did the animal kingdom for those formal mm -hmm. classifications, especially if you're a teacher or a lecturer, that's, that is a great view. Um, and I should preference this. I know Matt talked a little bit about web desktop and 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 syncing. Uh, Matt is and I are on the desktop view. It's a little bit more of a nice focus focus view. If you share your brain to the web browser, um, you get the standard view. Um, to uh, to do the expanded views, you you will have to use the uh, the desktop software, which is which is great um, to have on your uh, computer as well. So I think with that, we have uh, covered everything. Matt, any more final words of wisdom in terms of uh, explore, capture, and study in your brain? Well, I just want to thank everyone for joining today. As we mentioned right from the start, one of our favorite topics, just because um, you know the brain is all about uh, knowledge, retaining knowledge, knowledge management, and you know what could be better for a student, for a teacher, of, of having a process that gives you quick and easy access to all the disparate information sources that you may need. We're always available for you, support at thebrain.com. So even if we didn't get to your question today or you're using the brain and have a question in the future, reach out, let us know, we'd love to hear from you. All right, great. And with that, we're going to uh, close today's session. Thanks to everyone for uh, joining us. We hope to see you again on a future Brain Technologies event. And uh, we wish you well in uh, learning and expanding your mind with your digital brain. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.